Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming today. <clears throat> Looks like we have another big crowd. Uh, thanks for wearing your mask, speaking of which, I can't see. <clears throat> uh, and remember to practice your social distancing. As you well know, we are in a bit of a um, different lifestyle for the time being. So thank you for doing that. Um, the office is closed tomorrow, uh, it being Labor Day. Uh, Marilyn is getting ready for her retirement. She said she's going to spend all day making lists for Jeff tomorrow. <clears throat> Uh, on the back of your bulletin, uh, there's a little light bulb there, if you'll see that. Uh, that's where you can sign up for the uh, faith chat sessions, uh, which we were doing um, back uh, um, at the beginning of this crisis. Um, and also, if you are interested in taking a disciple class, um, how many of you have taken at least one disciple class? Raise your hand. Okay, thank you. If you have not, um, or if you, it's been a while since we've done it. Um, it is an awesome thing. It's one of the um, things that, one of the life-changing moments for me is, is, has been my disciple class. Uh, it's really um, unique. It's like one of those vacations you take and people say, how was it? And you really can't describe it. Well, disciples that way too. Um, it's, it's hard for me to uh, express to you how um, important and how interesting and how rewarding it is to take the class. So if you're interested in that, um, there's a way to do that and it's on the back of your bulletin, so go ahead and do that. Um, also today we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion. Uh, it will obviously be a tad different than we normally do it. Um, if you did not receive a communion cup, um, and would like one, uh, just raise your hand. And does anybody need one there? Everybody got them? So we're good for that? Okay. Um, these are self-contained, obviously, so that only you um, are going to touch it. Uh, and we will have a container someplace. Right over, ah, right there by Marilyn and Jeff. Uh, we have a waste basket. When you're done, you can drop your, uh, the contents of your, your little cup in there, please. Um, is there anything else I need to talk about? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, there is one more one thing though. Um, I want you to know that you know there's a lot of things even though we are um, not in church, there's a lot of things still going on in church. Uh, one of which is the um, my committee there, our SPRC. As you well know, um, Marilyn and uh, Jeff are going to be retiring soon. Marilyn real soon and Jeff you know, who knows soon, uh, right, Jeff? <clears throat> whenever, I was going to say whenever um, uh, Pastor Suzanne would let him go, but I think that would probably be the year 2028 or something like that. So um, anyway, uh, we are interviewing um, for Marilyn's job. We have also, uh, in the process of posting a um, position for uh, family, life. family life, ministry director or something like that is a big title anyway and they would be their primary responsibility would be the youth but they would also be coordinating uh for families of the youth and the um our, our young uh, um, our children's ministry as well so we're going to be posting that job pretty soon and then of course we are working on you know the posting for jeff's job so just so you know that that stuff's going on so with that I would invite you to stand and join me in our call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. <clears throat> our God, in the glory of late summer, we come to worship, reveling in the beauty of your handiwork. Give us insight this morning into all the work of our hands, as part of the work of your hands. We join with you in lifting the heavy hearted, comforting the sorrowful and calming the anxious. Fill us with the satisfaction of worthy work and the joy of restful Sabbath this morning. Now, we invite you to remain standing and sit, uh, join us in our opening hymn, which is printed in your bulletin. <laughs>
this morning, we're going to do our prayer time a little bit different. We're going to do something called a litany of labor. And it's still a prayer, but it's kind of a liturgy piece. So you have a response to each section. And the response is printed in your bulletin. It's we give you thanks, oh God. Let's do that together. We give you thanks, oh God. Good. So I'm going to lead us in that. And then when it's your turn, I'll give the... So here we go. Oh man, wow. Let's try that again. Let us pray to the Lord of all creation, from whom comes life and work and purpose. Almighty God, when you formed us lovingly out of the dust of the earth, you breathed into us the breath of life and gave us work and purpose for living. You placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it. We give you thanks, O oh God. Through our work, you made us co-creators with you, shaping the world in which we live. You gave dignity to our labor by sending your Son to labor with us. We give you thanks, O oh God. By our labor, you enrich the world. By our labor, we enjoy the fruits of creation. By our labor, we find direction and purpose. By our labor, our families are made secure. We give you thanks, O God, for providing varieties of work and for blessing us by our labor. We give you thanks, O God, for those who plow the field and those who make the plow, for farmers and farm workers, for steel workers and machinists, for those who work with their hands and those who move the earth. We give you thanks, O God, for those who tend to the sick and those who seek new cures, for doctors and nurses, for scientists and technicians, for those who keep notes and those who transcribe. We give you thanks, O oh God. For those who think and those who create, for inventors and explorers, for artists and musicians, for those who write books and those who entertain. We give you thanks, O oh God. For those who work in offices and those who work in warehouses, for secretaries and receptionists, for stockers and bookkeepers, for those who market products and for those who move them. We give you thanks, O oh God. For those who inspire our minds and those who motivate us, for teachers and preachers, for public servants and religious servants, for those who help the poor and those who work with our children. We give you thanks, O oh God. For those whose labor is tidiness and cleanliness, for janitors and sanitary workers, for dry cleaners and maids, for those who produce cleaning products and those who use them. We give you thanks, O oh God. For those who sail the waves and those who fly the skies, for captains and attendants, for astronauts and deep sea divers, for those who chart and those who navigate. We give you thanks, O oh God. Lord, you bless us all with skills and gifts for labor. You provide us opportunities to use them for the benefit of others as well as ourselves. Guard and protect those who labor in the world. Bless the work of our hands, O Lord. Look kindly upon the unemployed and the disabled. Give health to the sick, hope to the bereaved. Keep us from laboring only for greed. Help us love and be responsible in all that we do. Creator God, you are the source of all wisdom and purpose. You are the blessing of those who labor. Be with us in our labor to guide and govern our world. Give all men and women work that enhances human dignity and bonds us to one another. Give us pride in our work, a fair return for our labor, and joy in knowing that our work finds its source in you. In all things, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, we give you thanks, O God. Amen. <coughs> I've been <clears throat> liturgist, I don't know how many times, and I've also served in the pulpit as well, but this is strange. <laughs> A little different for me this morning. Uh, now is our time that we're going to um, offer our gifts that God has given us. If you have uh, brought your offering, there's a plate uh, right here beside Marilyn and Jeff. Um, that you can drop it in on the way out. Or you can mail it to the church, and I know many of you are using now using the EFT. And we thank you for that. 
Um, as <clears throat> chairman of the SPRC, I also sit on the Finance Committee. And as you can well imagine, uh, back in February and, and March, uh, there was more than just a little concern amongst us about what we were going to have to do and how we were going to deal with this. Uh, but as time has gone on, as Glenn has told us time after time, every meeting that we've had or any time I've run into him, he is amazed as we are and so, so thankful. Um, there are few places that are as well off as we are um, because of your generosity and your willingness to continue to give. Uh, and that money is being used to help people. Um, Tim and Linda Crandall are using um, some of it to um, supplement the food that's given to us uh, for the tiny pantry um, mm -hmm. and as well as for those people who have come and, and asked for assistance. Uh, we've, uh, we are allowed, we've been able to do that. We've also um, more than paid our apportionments so far. Uh, in fact, if we continue to do this as we um, have so far this year, uh, we will not even be making um, a payment in December. They will all be paid by then. And we have been in the 60 to 70 percent range over the last probably five, six, eight, ten years. And this year we will be not only 100 percent, but actually over probably a little over that. So thank you for that. And with that, I ask you to join me in a moment of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you have plans for me that are for my good and your glory. You said, give, and it will be given to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to our goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and continue to supply our needs. May your peace be in our hearts your grace be in our words, your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our souls. In your almighty name we pray. Amen. Now I ask you to stand as we sing the doxology. scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 10 verses 38 through 42 again another familiar passage that I'm sure you've heard numerous times and maybe even threw at your spouse once in a while now as the disciples went on their way Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my, my sister has let me do all the work myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. And Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God, which we say, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. I can't help myself when I hear that Martha, Martha. All I can hear is the Brady Bunch, right? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Mary and Martha. Along with some of the parables, this has got to be one of my favorite I'm going to have a chat with Jesus someday passages. I wonder what it would be like to count Jesus as one of your closest friends. Can you imagine that? There's an intimacy here that allows for Jesus to just 
drop by when he's in town to seek refuge in their company after a grueling time out on the road. But he's, you know, Jesus. So I imagine it's still a bit of occasion of an occasion when he comes to town and drops in, right? And here you have these two sisters who respond to the occasion in different ways. Martha, whose love language is acts of service, goes into a whirlwind of activity thinking, oh, what do I have to make for dinner? Jesus is here. Uh, leftovers? No. Uh, pizza? No. Um, fold over PB&Js? No. What do I have? Is it thawed? Where's the good tablecloth? Did that ever get washed after the last time it was he was here? Shoot, I need paprika. Maybe I can get Lazarus to run to the store and quick pick up some paprika. Why didn't Jesus let us know he was coming? Martha's doing what she does best. She's thinking of the practicalities that are pouring forth from her mind like an ever-flowing to-do list. She's a get-it-done girl. I imagine she's the older sister and probably feels the weight of responsibility to represent the family well. And she's good at it. But right now, in this moment, it feels like pressure. This is Jesus, after all. And then there's Mary. Mary is probably the baby of the family. Mary is all about people. Mary's love language is quality time. Mary would never dream of leaving Jesus to cool his heels in the living room and desert him to go into the kitchen because that would be rude and disrespectful. And besides, they just don't get to see Jesus often enough. And she doesn't want to waste this precious moment, this opportunity. And so she stops what she's doing and sits down at his feet and gives him 100% of her attention. And if we stop this story right here, we could look at the actions of Martha and Mary and say, I understand. They're both in their way paying respect to the significance of this visit. They're both honoring Jesus in their own ways according to their inherent love languages. But then the scene develops and the story gets trickier. Martha, who's sweating the details in the kitchen, starts to get annoyed with her sister. Look at her. Bam, she slams a pot down. Look at her just swooning away at the feet of Jesus, hanging on his every word. Bam, she slams a, clubber, a cupboard door closed. How come she doesn't come in here and help me get this done? And why is he letting her get away with that? He probably hasn't even noticed I'm missing. Bang, 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 bang. She stirs the soup louder than soup has ever been stirred before. <laughs> Who do they think is gonna get this dinner on the table anyway? Don't they think I'd like to come in and hear all about Jesus' latest, latest adventures? No, dinner is just magically gonna make itself. Now she's worked herself into a lather of anger and frustration. The labor of love has now become a boiling pot of resentment. And she goes storming into where Mary and Jesus are having their cozy little conversation and she boils over. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Why don't you tell her to get in here and help me out? Now, how many of you are firmly on Martha's side here? I'm always on Martha's side. There's no reason Mary can't get her little butt in the kitchen and make the work go faster so they can both sit at the feet of Jesus, right? Or how about if somebody invites Jesus into the kitchen and his holy self can peel some potatoes while we're making dinner? I think that most of us can relate to this feeling of being put upon. When there's work to be done and the stress is on and you're digging in and digging deeper and others are over there dancing to the tune of some other lesser priority and the anger and the frustration build until you resent everyone and the horse they rode in on. I know, you know what I'm talking about. And in that most intense moment of self-righteous anger, 
when Martha is looking for righteous validation for the important work she's doing. Jesus does what Jesus does best. He takes this moral lesson and he turns it sideways. And he gently says to Martha, 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 you're so stressed right now, worrying about so many things. Right now, only one thing is important. And Mary has chosen that thing, the thing that can never be taken away. Translation, Martha, you've worked yourself into anger and resentment over something that will pass away. Years from now, no one is going to remember what we ate or whether there even was a tablecloth or whether you compensated for paprika by adding more garlic. All that we'll remember is the time we spent together. This is such an important life lesson for all of us and perhaps particularly relevant as we honor the contributions of labor in our country. This is a Martha day. Tomorrow is a Martha day. <laughs> it's a day where we recognize all the ways that we work hard for noble purposes. And it's right to recognize the importance of being good laborers. Labor builds communities and our nation. Labor takes care of people. And on a personal lover level, labor gives us a sense of purpose and accomplishment. And it supports our families. Labor is a value that is upheld by scripture. We are all called to work hard for the good of our community and the good of our families. Labor is good. Martha's sin is not that she was a laborer. Martha's sin was that she became so consumed by it that she lost sight of what was important in the moment. And in so doing, she let some fairly destructive emotions consume her, and even worse, in the midst of the building storm, she deprived herself of what is singularly most important in life, the time that we spend with family, time spent with Jesus. Not long after Jim and I moved to Tennessee with two young boys, I had a real Martha moment and an epiphany. We moved and Jim went to work right away for Nissan. And at that time, the traditional Japanese culture of the company prevailed. And what that meant is that they wanted him to be at his desk at 7.30 in the morning and still there at 7.30 at night. Now, Sean was in third grade and I had just gotten John settled into a nice daycare between the house and the elementary school. And meanwhile, I had found a job in Nashville, which meant I was making the hellish 30 plus mile commute back and forth every day. So we were a busy little family, especially during the week. Now when Saturday rolled around, we all had different priorities about what that day was for. For the boys who'd been on a rigorous schedule during the week, they just wanted to play. They wanted to play with their toys and watch cartoons and be boys. For Jim, it was about catching up on chores and paying bills and getting it all out of the way for some veg time, watching golf or football. For me, by the end of the week, the state of the house was out of control and I could not deal with that. And as the weekend progressed, while I tried to clean and organize, the boys dragged out more and more toys and stuff and built forts and they were just doing their best to be boys. And this was a Martha Mary moment in the making. The culmination of which occurred one day, shortly after I had finished washing the white linoleum kitchen floor and Sean came in to get a glass of juice and ended up spilling an entire pitcher of red Kool-Aid on the freshly washed floor. Do you know just how far red Kool-Aid can reach when dropped from counter height? Do you believe for one moment that there was a single item anywhere in the kitchen that didn't have sticky red juice on it? I want you to know that I deserve the Mother of the Year Award for not coming down on that poor kid like the wrath of God, which was probably what was going on inside my head at the time. I cleaned him up and moved him along, and then I sat down on the floor and cried. 
as I realized that I was spending my entire weekend, every weekend, chasing dust bunnies and just generally being a shrew as I tried to meet in a house where little boys were just being little boys. And that I was depriving myself of this really precious time that was going to fly by way too fast. I wasn't sitting around and playing games with them. I was angry all the time. So rather than be frustrated that some chore or other wasn't getting done, I was thinking I should be sitting with Jim on the couch watching football because time together is everything. Over the years of family life, we continue to work on our Martha Mary balance. We work hard. We believe that's important. And I want a clean house. But since that day, but not since that day, have I allowed a clean house to take priority over the people who live in it. We're dedicated to our jobs. We take pride in doing good work and being reliable people. But we also take every day of vacation that we're entitled to every year. Jim and I could have been more ambitious in our careers, but we both decided that the time we spent together was most important. We agreed that we work to live, we don't live to work. And it's not that way in every culture, and it's not that way in every household. Early on in his career with Nissan, Jim spoke to his supervise, supervisors and he told them, I'm a dad first. So I'll work hard and I'll put in a full day every day. But when it's time to go home and be with my boys, I'm gonna have to go. And that could have ended his career at Nissan. But at the end of this month, Jim will be retiring from Nissan after 31 years. The story of Martha and Mary isn't about villainizing Martha. And Lord knows the world wouldn't work very well if all we did was sit around and gaze adoringly at each other. But the key in this story, as is often in the case with biblical stories, is in the little words. It's in the word distracted, which is used twice to describe Martha. Martha had become distracted by her many tasks. In other words, Martha had lost focus on what was important in the moment. And she allowed that distraction to build up anger and resentment. And the key to the story is in the word chosen. In that particular time and circumstance, Mary had chosen the better part. Mary had made a choice between two priorities and had chosen the one that could not be taken away from her. In our lives, we have to always be aware that we have choices that are about our priorities. We can actually choose our paths based on what is most important. I want a really clean house and I hardly ever have one. And the reason for that is because when all is said and done, I am never gonna look back and remember what the baseboards look like. But I will remember the time that I spend with the people who are important to me. Likewise, I'll always be proud of the satisfaction I received from my career, but that will never have the impact on my life that Jesus has had. Time spent in the company of God, time spent studying God's holy word, time spent honing the teachings of Jesus into a model for my life. That's been the best investment I could possibly make in the character of who I am. And I get to choose that. There are times when we set everything else aside so that we can sit at the feet of Jesus. There are times when we set everything else aside so that we can finally give our full attention to the people who are important in our lives. Tomorrow, celebrate the labors of your life. Celebrate the labors of all who have given so much of their lives, making the world a better place. Celebrate the opportunity that we have to labor for the support and care of our families. But on Tuesday, when you go back to work, remember to keep your Martha and Mary moments in balance. Set your priorities for a healthy balance of work and time with your family and time spent at the feet of Jesus for this can never be taken away from you. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy and loving God, just as you made light to offset the darkness, you've made our lives to be rich in the contrasts of experiences and priorities. You've given us time to work and time to play and time to rest. You've given us the ability to live and thrive in multi-dimensional lives. Be at work in us as we live our lives each day sorting through the priorities of the moments. Help us to work hard and well and help us to recognize when it's time to set work aside and enjoy the company of the people we love. And help us to always find time to sit at the feet of Jesus. Holy God, today we lift to you the concerns of our church family, our community, our nation, and our world. Be with those who are suffering the aftermath of fire and storms. Be with all who are working to raise awareness of injustice and those who are working to quell violence in the midst of peaceful protest. We ask that you work in and through us so that we might be the best example of citizens, respectful of each other, and yet courageous to speak and act for the highest ideals of a just society. For it's only in taking responsibility for our own actions that we can cast a vision for kingdom living. Lord, be with us now as we celebrate the gift of Holy Communion, as we partake of the bread and the cup, and remember who and whose we are, as we remember the loving and redeeming acts of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As we prepare to celebrate communion together, let me just remind you that whether you're watching at home or you're here on this hillside, that Jesus invites all who love him to come to the table and be fed. In other words, everyone is invited to partake in the sacrament that draws us into community with Jesus and with each other, and that changes us, us for good and forever. Let us now celebrate. Now oh, this will be tricky. I'm gonna shout now. I'm gonna shout communion at you. <laughs> After laboring in the streets of Jerusalem, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God, Jesus took bread in his hands. He blessed this food and he gave thanks, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup filled with gifts of the vine and he blessed it and he reminded them, whenever you drink of this, do it in remembrance of me. Spirit of wisdom and wonder, wind around these elements today. May they stir us from stagnation into act actively loving God, our neighbors, and ourselves. May our participation at this table transform us into the people God is calling us to be. With gratitude, we partake of the gifts of bread and cup. As we take the bread, let it be for us as though we're sitting at the feet of Jesus. As we drink of the fruit of the vine, let us remember that the grace that pours from God is what builds us into God's people. Amen. You may partake of your elements, and afterwards I invite you to be in a moment of prayer for the balance of Martha and Mary moments in your life. Let us be fed.
holy and loving God, we give you thanks for your love and grace and for the way you feed us and transform us. Bless us now as we open our lives to you. Fill us and use us and make us wholly yours. Amen. Our closing hymn can be found in your bulletin. Listen and sing these words from your heart. Please stand as you're able. your bulletin and sign up for those faith chat classes or um, if you're interested in disciple bible study i hope you'll give that some prayerful consideration um, also a reminder that next sunday is dinner in the park and uh, if you haven't had a chance to talk to mike buckner about what you can do to support that mission um, please do that we definitely want to keep this going particularly in this time of need also um, you should have received your newsletter by now and in it is a survey that survey is really important to me. It is really helpful for me to know how you think and what classes I need to be working to offer in the days to come to serve your faith growth experience. Also, part of the, the questions are about how you feel about when it's time to move this back into the sanctuary. And so, um, you know, if you all say, boy, I really would like to do that, but I'm not comfortable doing it, that's helpful for me to know. So um, you can bring those, you can drop them off, you can mail them, but please, or you can email me, just email me your responses. Um, I would appreciate that, that's very helpful. So now, as you go out into the world this week, may you labor well, may you take pride in the work you do, for it's God's gift of purpose to your life. And may you remember to spend quality time with those that you love and in the company of them because it's God's blessing on your life and most of all may you remember to spend time at the feet of Jesus for it is the miracle of God's grace bestowed upon you for your eternal life go in peace amen <laughs> Thank you.